we'll go ahead and get started. Let's take our chorus books and turn to number four. Jesus Christ is made to me all I need, all I need. He alone is all my plea, He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption full and sure, He is all I need. Jesus is my all in all, all I need, all I need. While He keeps, I cannot fall, He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption full and sure, He is all I need. He redeemed me when He died, all I need, all I need. I with Him was crucified, He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption full and sure, He is all I need. He's the treasure of my soul, all I need, all I need. He hath cleansed and made me whole, He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption full and sure, He is all I need. Glory, glory to the Lamb, all I need, all I need. By His Spirit sealed I am, He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption full and sure, He is all I need. Let's take our Bibles and look together in Proverbs chapter 14. And my text is from verse 22 down to verse 35. And I've entitled this message, Two Ways. When you read the scriptures, you find that there is a way that is a broad way, as the Lord Jesus Christ describes it, but it leads to destruction. And then there is the narrow way. Straight is the gate. And that way leads to eternal life. You can go all the way back to Cain and Abel. There's the way of Abel, which is by the blood sacrifice alone, representing the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's the way of Cain, which is that of works, approaching unto God by one's works and thinking to find acceptance. But the reality is that although there are two ways, there is really only one way that leads to eternal life. And we know that. We've traveled sometimes. You think you're on the right way, and then all of a sudden you realize you're going the wrong way. So you can either keep going the wrong way and say, oh well, or you can turn around. And that's really what conversion is, where the Spirit of God, by His grace, because we're all born on the wrong way. We're born in sin and trespasses, and it, it takes the Lord, by His grace and mercy, to convert the heart and cause us to move from the false way to the true way. So here in Proverbs chapter 14, and I'm going to read this entire portion, then we'll have a word of prayer. But as I read, see if you can see how in each verse, each way is represented. And herein is the wisdom of God to be able to see what is the false way. 
and see what is the right way. Here in verse 22 it says, Do they not err that devise evil? But mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. The crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. A true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. In the multitude of people is the king's honor, but in the want of people is the destruction of the prince. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth his maker, but he that honoreth him hath mercy on the poor. The wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous hath hope in his death. Wisdom resteth in the heart of him that hath understanding, but that which is in the midst of fools is made known. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him that causeth shame. Gracious Lord, as we take up your word, I'm mindful of how even what we have read here is far beyond what we could ever imagine or think. We read the words and we attempt to apprehend the significance of these words, but we know and I confess that only by your spirit of grace can we fully enter into the wisdom that is here revealed, that wisdom that is from above, that wisdom which you alone give, that wisdom which is in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, alone. And so I pray that you would grant us discernment as we study this portion. And that if you've been pleased by your grace and mercy to deliver us from the false way and to cause us to be in the right way, you alone receive the glory, else we would be just like anybody else. So may our hearts be humbled even now as we look into your word, and I pray that your spirit would be our teacher. And I give you the praise, honor, and glory in our dear Savior's name. Amen. So as I read this particular portion of scripture, what I want to do is go back down through these verses and look at the two ways. And in verse 22, and these are titles that the Lord has directed me to put down here. You might have some other ways of presenting it, but the important thing is the verse, the scriptures and what it say. But in verse 22, you've got the way of evil versus the way of good. There is a way of evil. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. And that's what we have described here, the way of evil versus the way of good. It says, do they not err that devise evil? So stop and think about who we are as sinners, born this way. We're born in this way of evil. Even way back there in Genesis chapter 6, if you want to look there, with me, it describes those in the way of evil. And we'd have to say, such is our nature, but for the grace of God. I know we hear people say today that things are as evil as they ever have been and worse. 
Well, I would agree they're as evil as they ever have been, but not necessarily worse. We have, perhaps due to technology and mass communication, ways of being exposed to more evil just because of these the media. But in reality, the heart has never been changed or different ever since the fall. You think about the evil of Adam's way in looking upon that tree of the knowledge of good and evil that the Lord said, do not eat of. And they had there the tree of life and yet chose. Here's where, again, you go all the way back to Adam. People say, well, I think God ought to give man the choice. Here was man in his best state. And yet, given that choice, what did he do? He rebelled against God. And if it was the case with Adam, how much more so even now with those sons of Adam that we are? We start from a depraved state and go down from there. Here in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, how evil is the heart? It says, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And notice that every, not just word or action, but every imagination of the thoughts. <laughs> I don't know if you can, how you can break that down. There's the thoughts and then there's the imagination of the thoughts. That is, it says here, of his heart, only evil continually. Some people think, well, there's times where we think evil thoughts, and then there's times when we don't. It, that's not what the scripture says. The imagination of the heart is to devise evil always. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you plot the murder of somebody, or you plot going and robbing a bank, or doing this or that. Do you realize that to err in your mind and your imagination and devising evil is as simple as taking to yourself any glory that belongs unto God alone? Now put yourself under the light of Scripture. Who can ever plead anything but guilty? Even today, getting up and getting dressed and getting our day going, etc. How many of our thoughts have been only toward ourselves? And the proof is that when something doesn't go the way we planned, we get mad. We get angry. We lash out. Some even, you may not speak it in your mouth, but you cursed in your mind. That is the way of evil. So when you think of the way of evil, don't think about what's out there. It's like one of the men back in the mid-1500s that locked himself into a room and sat there with the scriptures and read the scriptures in mind of overcoming temptation and evil that was in his mind. And then suddenly realized that when he walked into that room and locked the door, he brought the evil in with him. Such is this heart. And so when it describes the way of evil and those that err in devising evil, it comes from the heart. Christ told the Pharisees, it's not what enters into the body that defiles a man, but what comes out of the body. Here were these men that thought themselves to be upright and looked down their nose at others, and yet they themselves were as evil as those that were con condemning. But it says here in Proverbs 14 and verse 22, it's the way of evil versus the way of good. Now here's the part where every word of Scripture is vital. Because even if you were to say, well, from this point forward, I'm going to devise good. Even that is an evil thought. To think that somehow I can in any way devise good of myself out of this evil heart. That's why in Jeremiah, he said, can the leper change his spots? You see a leopard with spots. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? 
If that were possible, then yes, you could, being evil, do good. But we can't. Here are the two words in verse 22 that are not to be missed. When it says, but mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. To devise good, and I've mentioned to you before that the word good pertains to God alone. To have thoughts toward God. Well, how does anyone whose heart is ever only toward evil ever have a good thought toward God? A God thought. Well, there's the two words in verse 22, mercy and truth. And notice how it's put. Mercy and truth shall be. In other words, if any one of us in this heart is brought to look away from ourselves and acknowledge that everything in us is evil and that God alone is good, it's going to be by His mercy and truth alone. Don't get that backward. Don't think, well, if I just devise good, then God will show me mercy and truth. No, it's just the opposite. That mercy and truth pertain to the Lord Jesus Christ. In the person of Christ and His work accomplished at Calvary, Psalm 85 says, Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed one another. You can't read Proverbs 14.22 and not see that any good, if there's to be any good in me, it's only going to be and even the word be is passive, isn't it? It's not something you act upon in order to accomplish. No. The way to read it in shall be is in italic, but it's, it's understood in the sense. Mercy and truth to them that devise good. It's much like over in John chapter 1. If you look there with me. How is it that any believe? It's good to believe on Christ, but how can any believe on Christ? It's not of ourselves. It says in John 1 and verse 11, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. That shouldn't surprise us, because that is the, the devising of evil. That's exactly what condemned Cain. When the Lord said to Cain that he didn't accept his offering, but... Do that which is good, is what he told Cain. What was good? To go find that blood sacrifice and come and offer it. And he told Cain, otherwise sin lies at the door. Nothing that these hands can do can ever bring satisfaction with the Holy God. And so, just like these here mentioned in John 1, where he came unto his own, but his own received him not, did not welcome him, Treated him as a stranger, much like you would when someone knocks on your door and you open it real slightly and you don't recognize the person. You're not just opening the door and welcoming them in. You want, you want to know who they are. But the evil of the heart, even with regard to those to whom Christ came, it says there, his own received him not. That was the continual unbelieving attitude toward him. But then verse 12 says, but as many as received him. See, this is the, the truth of Scripture, that there are those that God has purposed to teach of himself and turn from their evil way. That's what repentance is, repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. But how is it that any do turn? How is it that any of us have believed? People read that and it says in verse 12 of John 1, as many as received him, they read that in the sense of then gave he power to be, become the sons of God. But that's not what it says. If there are any that have received the Lord Jesus Christ, believed on him as he's revealed here in this word, and trusting in him, ever coming to him, never leaving this way, it's because he gave them the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe. So don't get it backwards. Just like here, don't get it backwards. Don't read this 
in verse 22, now, if you'll just devise good, like you hear so many preachers saying, if you'll just make the decision, if you'll just exercise your free will, and even that, you see how that's an abomination? Our wills aren't free. We just read it in Genesis 6. Our, our thoughts, the imagination of our thoughts is only evil. Continue every day. There is no such thing as free will. Our will is just, as I mentioned before, like that tennis ball. Turn it loose, it can only go down. I've heard it explained too about an eagle flying over a cornfield. There's a lot of corn. But that eagle is not interested in the corn. You've never seen an eagle suddenly dive down and grab a stalk of corn, a cob, and start eating away. But you find one little creature, critter running through that field, that eagle's going for it. That's his nature. And the same with ourselves. Left to ourselves, we would never choose God. We would never come to Christ. We'd be like that eagle pursuing the destruction of some other thing, even ourselves. But mercy and truth to them that devise good. In other words, if there are any whose thought and heart is toward God, because that's what it is to devise good. It's not building up ourselves, but toward God. The reason is because God has already poured out His mercy on such that they might know Him in truth. And you think about those two attributes of God here in verse 22 that are mentioned, mercy and truth. How can God be just and yet exercise mercy? That's what the word truth is about. How can God be a God of truth, knowing and seeing us as sinners as we are, and yet exercise mercy? It certainly is not based on anything in us. But again, I don't know if you've ever seen that verse, but over in Psalm 85, if you'll take the time to highlight that, Let's go back up to verse 7, this entire chapter, but for our purposes, notice the cry here in verse 7. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. The cry here is not just for temporal mercies. Most people today that don't know anything of God, they're thankful if they're a farmer when God causes it to rain on their field and grow their crops. And People will look at it and say, well, you must be living right. No, nope. it's mercy. God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. But those that seek the Lord for his saving mercy, that's what this is about. O Lord, grant us thy salvation. Notice whose salvation it is. Thy salvation. And then verse 8 is so key because there's times when People will come to talk to you and they're burdened for a little bit about their soul. And they seem to be under conviction of their state before God. And what's the first thing you want to do? You want to help them come to Christ. You want to show them what they need to do. But look at here. Verse 8 says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. The best thing you can do with others that show some concern is, Leave them alone. Turn them to the Lord. It's like the man one time that called a preacher. And the preacher came over for some coffee and sat down. And the man said to him, I believe I'm lost. I need to know what I, I need to do to get saved. And the preacher answered wisely. He said, well, who told you you were lost? He said, well, I believe it's the Lord. And he said, well, then look to the Lord for how it is. He'd be pleased to save you if he will. Just left it at that. Didn't try to advise him. Didn't try to give him the ABCs of salvation. Just, well, whoever has brought that thought to your heart, he's the one that's going to deal with you as he will. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to whom? Unto his people and to his saints, those that he has justified in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
but let them not turn again, notice, to folly. So even here you got the two ways. The way of mercy and truth, and in any other way is the way of folly. It would be folly for any of us to think, well, I've got this conviction, now I've got to run and do something about it. No. It says in verse 9, Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him. Where does the fear of the Lord come but through the work of the Spirit of grace in the heart? That glory may dwell in our land. Where you see glory, think of Christ, who is the very glory of God. How is it that He dwells among sinners? It's only in that salvation that He came and worked out. That's why it says, Surely His salvation is nigh them that fear Him. It's repeated again, His salvation, Thy salvation. When people sometimes ask me, Well, can a Christian lose their salvation? Well, just the way you ask the question, you have to say yes. When you say their salvation, you think they have done something about it? There was no salvation at all. That's, that's going away. But none can lose his salvation because from eternity he purposed it and the Lord Jesus Christ came in the fullness of time and accomplished it and now the Spirit of God reveals it. That can never be lost. Let them not turn again to folly. To turn again to folly is like so many today that profess salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's that, but you got to keep it going. If you ever turn away, then you've lost what the Lord bought for you. That's not the salvation of Scripture. So in verse 10, when it says mercy and truth are met together, Think in terms of God's attributes. God does not lower any one of his attributes in order to show mercy. Because the attributes of God are his justice, his righteousness, truth, and yet mercy and grace are just as equally who God is. So you say, well, how then can he save? Well, it tells us mercy and truth are met together. Those words describe a harmonizing together. We look at it as opposites. But when the Lord Jesus Christ came and paid the sin debt, there was truth speaking. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. God cannot in any wise, in truth, and honor the truth, declare a sinner to be saved apart from that truth being satisfied. And yet, on the other hand, you have His mercy. He's a merciful God. The fact that He has purposed to show mercy even to one sinner, such as myself. People worry about how many He's passed by. That shouldn't startle us. That's His justice. That's His righteousness. But how can He be God and declare a wretch like me to be an object of His mercy? Well, it has to be that truth is satisfied. And thus the importance of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ where he earned and established this truth. He is truth. He could do no otherwise. And yet, having paid the debt, there remains nothing but mercy to be shown to those for whom Christ paid the debt. And that's explained in the second part of verse 11. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. That word kissed means there's a satisfaction between righteousness and the peace that is accorded to those for whom Christ paid the debt. And verse 11 describes how that would take place. Truth shall spring out of the earth. Think of what Isaiah described in Isaiah 53. That he was like that plant that grew up in the wilderness, in the desert. People that looked upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why it says he came on his own, his own received him not. They didn't see in him the God-man. But he grew up. The truth sprung up out of the earth. It was decreed from heaven, but it wasn't accomplished in heaven. It took the Lord Jesus Christ coming in flesh and blood to work out this salvation 
It says, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. In other words, everything that the Lord Jesus Christ came to accomplish, God in His justice had His eye on His Son. And even there, had the Lord in any way left one part of God's righteousness undone, there would be no salvation. And our Lord Jesus Christ knew that as the substitute. He had to be sinless in every aspect of God's righteousness. Else, His sacrifice, His work would not have satisfied God's law and righteousness. And that's why from the cross He cried, it is finished. So complete is that work of the Lord Jesus Christ to the satisfaction of God the Father, the sinless, blameless Lamb. He wasn't tarnished by the sin of the people that was laid upon Him. Just the opposite. It was righteousness itself that took that sin upon Him to satisfy God's law and justice, that God might be just and justified. And so verse 12 says, Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good. That's what we're reading about over here in Proverbs chapter 14. Mercy and truth to them that devise good. The goodness that comes from the Spirit of God causing these hearts to see in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ how mercy and truth have met together. It turns this otherwise evil heart to this one who was pleased to show mercy and truth. Otherwise, the heart just becomes harder and harder. It's like a dead body. The longer you let it sit, the harder it becomes. The rigor mortis sets in. You're not going to bring that body back. You're not bringing life back to it. So that's the way of evil and versus the way of good. Now, Let's move on to verse 23. Here we see the way of destruction versus the way of true riches. It says here in verse 23, in all labor there is profit. But the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. Penury means to want or to poverty or destitution, barrenness. Those would be all synonyms of penury. So you have here the way of destruction versus, if you will, the way of true riches because it says there, in all labor there is profit. I know some may be thinking, well, how does that line up with what we just saw, that not the works of this hand can profit anything. But even as the scriptures say, well, first of all, there's the labor of Christ. The labor which he did is profitable. In other words, not no part of Christ's labor. And you can think in terms of even in life, people say good luck. There is no good luck. It's described as work, W-O-R-K. You go to work and you apply yourself to labor and the results come from it. Now, because we're fallen sinners, those results aren't always what we would like and yet we know that if we just stand and talk about work, and that's really the second part of this Verse 23, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. Just talk about it, but never go to work. There's going to be nothing but demise in the end of it. So there is that labor of the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Lord described to his disciples when they came back with food, thinking he would be hungry and wanting to eat. And he spoke of the labor of that he came to accomplish while it was day. There was a determined end to what the Lord Jesus Christ would do. And the labor of the Lord Jesus Christ is profit. In other words, he earned and established that righteousness on behalf of such sinners as we are. 
And the result is always going to be, as he said, I'll not lose one that the Father has given me. So we have the example of his labor. But also, does not the scripture say, labor to enter into his rest? You say, well, that sounds like a contradiction. How do you labor to enter into his rest? Well, the labor there is resting. And in that labor, there is profit. Unlike the world that is running around thinking that by their works and their doing, they call that the labor, that somehow they're going to have a successful result. They won't. To labor to enter into his rest is to determine by God's grace to rest in Christ alone. And I'll tell you that by God's grace takes determination not to be turned away into thinking that somehow my laboring is what will gain me access with God. So you've got really two extremes here in verse 23. You've got some that labor, but it's not to profit. It's because, and there it is, that way of destitution. Because it's not going to be by the works of our hands that we're going to stand justified before God. The scriptures are clear about that. There shall none be justified before God by the works of their hands. But there is a laboring, first of all, through Christ's laboring, having accomplished the work, but now in our own souls and spirits, the endeavoring to enter into that rest, which means nothing more than resting. I'm the worst one for having to take naps. I remember back when I was in boarding school, and even before then, they had nap time during school, and the teacher always had to keep saying, Can I keep your head down? You know, that was a labor to rest because my flesh and the way the Lord had built me was always to be, you know, I, I'm the kind, if I fall asleep, I'm always worried about missing something. So you're supposed to be resting when this flesh says, no, you need to be doing. So there is that way that is not to profit, but the labor here in all labor, just like in the physical temporal world, if you've got a nice house that you build or if you've got a vehicle that you bought and you're maintaining it, you can tell the difference by the dedication to taking care of and building as opposed to somebody that just doesn't care and lets things go the way they would go. That would be our case. There would be left ourselves no labor unto profit were it not for the grace of God. But the second part of the verse, in verse 23, says the talk of lips tendeth only to penury. How many are there that speak, just like some that speak about work but never actually get around to doing it? How many are there that actually speak or with the lips profess to be the Lord's and profess to be laboring to that end, and yet that's all it is. It's just talk. I dare say that this describes everybody that's in works religion today. They talk a good talk. They act as if somehow by their labors they are accomplishing something by way of acceptance before God. But I'll tell you, it's just talk. Because there's nothing in ourselves. We could not even begin to accomplish that labor, accomplish that work that God requires to his satisfaction. We couldn't. That's why Paul wrote there in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21, if righteousness come by law, then Christ is dead in vain. If righteousness, if justice could be obtained by any observance of the law on our part, then you make the work of Christ in none effect. That's why it can't be both ways. And here it describes, again, in the physical world, in all labor, there is profit in the physical world. But apart from Christ's labor, apart from Christ doing the work, apart from Christ accomplishing all that was necessary for God's law and justice to be satisfied, then there would be no profit. That's why in things of life, I get up and I go to work and 
I labor to provide for my family, and I can see a response or a result from that labor. That's just how God has made this world. But when it comes to things eternal, when it comes to satisfying a holy and just God, that gets taken completely out of our hands. It's due to the labor of another that there's profit. And anything other than that is just simple, foolish talk. The talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. In other words, if we try in any way to build ourselves up, we're only going to know insufficiency and barrenness and destitution and poverty, extreme dearth. That's why in the day of judgment, there's going to be many there that will say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many mighty works in your name, prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and Christ will say, I never knew you. That's not the work that he requires. That's just the talk of the lips to no satisfaction to a holy God. Only the work of Christ satisfies. But we'll come back to this. There's a lot here. And uh, we're chipping away at the rock. The rock being Christ, right? And I pray that the Lord will use what we've heard so far today. All right.